Good morning, City Press. Thanks again for tuning in this morning. Um, this is our final week in Jonah, and so I just uh, wanted to thank you for, for taking the time to to be a part of this the last few weeks. I wanted to thank Mark and uh, the leadership at City Press for allowing me to, to step in as well. And um, So yeah, so it's been good. So I just wanted to say thank you for for allowing me to, to fill in for a little bit. Um, so, Jonah 4. Uh, not much of, by way of intro, um, but just this. I, I'm, I'm going to read it, and I want you to listen for um, a, a couple of themes. Like, I, I don't even really have a um, um, subheadings or anything like that this morning. Um, just kind of one one big main point and that is um, it's mercy and anger mercy and anger um, so here's Jonah Jonah 4 but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said oh Lord is not this what I said when I was yet in my country that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yes. Yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor. Nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. It is absolutely true, and it has been given to us in love. So, if we were to kind of hone in on one particular emotion, in our time and culture right now, and even within the church, um, I think it's safe to say that anger is the emotion. Some of you, if not most of you, maybe even all of you, as you watch this this morning, uh, you have either uh, felt a strong sense of anger of late or you're feeling it right now, and, th and there's several reasons for that. Um, I, I, please don't think that I am uh, making light of, of anger or downplaying it in any way. Like, it's valid. Um, so some of you are angry that the, the, the pandemic is still going on and doesn't seem to be slowing down in any way, shape, or form. Uh, some of you are angry um, from the debate the other night. There's still lingering effects from that. Uh, some of you are angry because you see people not wearing a mask. Uh, some of you are angry because you think it's stupid that you still have to wear a mask. Uh, some of you are angry because uh, the Republican Party is trying to get another Supreme Court justice in before the election in November. Some of you are angry um, because there were no indictments given in the Breonna Taylor shooting in Louisville this past week. Some of you are angry because of the way others responded 
to that decision. Some of you are angry, um, maybe even at the church's leadership right now. You don't feel like they're doing enough or they're doing the wrong things. Some of you are angry at our government. Uh, no matter what they do, you're just going to be angry with them because it's the government. Uh, some of you are angry with your child's teachers um, and the way this whole education thing is going. You're angry at the school administrators. Some of you are angry at your parents, your coworkers, your friends, your children, your neighbors, your spouse even, because they do not see things the way that you see them. And perhaps, and maybe last but not least, uh, you're angry at God. You're angry at God because he's not doing what you think he should be doing. Certainly not doing it in the timing that you think he should be doing it in. And how does God respond to that? How does God respond to your anger? The God of the Bible never says, get over it. The God of the Bible never says, suck it up, deal with it. The God of the Bible never says, um, you know, it's fine, you're okay, don't worry about it. No, the God of the Bible actually says, um, okay, okay, you're angry, and you need to acknowledge that. And you need to, uh, to not stuff it, don't ignore it, learn how to bring it to me, because I'm big enough to deal with it. God has created you in his image. And part of what that means is that um, that means you're going to get angry. Look, God gets angry. It's all through the scripture. Jesus gets angry. And, and sure, there is some degrees of difference. Um, there is some what we call righteous anger. That I'm not going to go into all that this morning. It is different. But nonetheless... Um, because you were created in the image of a God who gets angry, anger is part of what it means to be human. So, um, so my encouragement to you is to pay attention to that anger. There, um, uh, and, and the reason for that is because, I mean, I've said this before, um, emotions tell you something. Emotions tell you what is important to you. Emotions tell you what is valuable to you. And so if you just simply try to ignore it or to numb it, then you're missing a vital part of who God has created you to be. Now, the, the, what we have to be careful of is that there, there are often two ditches that we fall into with anger. And so the, we're, we're kind of walking that fine line, right? You got a, a, a ditch on this side and a ditch on this side. And, and one of those ditches is, is that what I said before is that we, we try to ignore it or numb it or just simply stuff it. Um, but the, the problem with that is that you cannot simply pick and choose the feelings that you're going to numb or ignore. So in your attempt to numb or ignore anger, you may very well be ignoring or numbing joy. You don't get to turn emotions off. You don't get to decide which ones you're going to feel and which ones you're not. And so that's one ditch. On the other hand, you can begin to let anger take over. Um, my counselor, because I need counseling, um, my counselor has described it as is sometimes we let anger into the driver's seat. And so um, when the anger takes over, we, we do things and we say things that under normal circumstances we would not normally say or do. So the two ways, right? You either, you either numb it or stuff it, or you let it take over. You let it control you. My question this morning is, is, is there a third way? Is there a third way that where our anger is actually informed by the magnitude of God's mercy. 
Is it possible that in Jesus, anger and mercy kiss, as it were? Now look, there's no doubt Jonah is angry. <laughs> uh, six times in 11 verses, the word anger or angry is used. Uh, this is the way chapter 4 uh, begins. Verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, what is the it? If you remember from chapter 3, the it is that um, the Lord did not destroy Nineveh like Jonah was hoping he would do. Uh, so he, so this is what he says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? I knew that you would do this. I knew you would show mercy, and I don't want you to. I don't want to be a part of that, Jonah's saying. And so I fled. I went the opposite way. And it's so disturbing to Jonah, this act of mercy that God shows. It says in the English, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And the Hebrew says, to Jonah it was exceedingly evil. It's exceedingly evil. God does not do what Jonah thought he should do. God chooses mercy <laughs> And Jonah, of all people, calls it evil. God shows incredible patience and compassion and grace and steadfast love. And Jonah gets angry. See, for Jonah, his anger is taking over. His anger is in the front seat, if you will. It's driving the bus. And this was his motivation for trying to get to Tarshish. He ta his anger takes over and he goes the exact opposite way from which God calls him. He doesn't want anything to do with what God is planning on. His anger takes over and he would rather be thrown overboard and drowned than to go to Nineveh and offer them the opportunity to repent. And now in chapter 4, his anger takes over in such a way that he's more concerned about a plant than he is about 120,000 human beings created the image of God and even their cattle. So notice the, the, the way that the words are played here. In verse 1, it says, But it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And then later down in verse 6, it says, Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Exceedingly displeased about God's mercy. Exceedingly glad about a plant. This is what happens when anger takes over. Now, to be fair, um, Jonah is not just simply being a, a pouty brat who who has not gotten his way um i mean the, we, we have to keep in mind and, and i think i've said this before we have to keep in mind that the assyrians were not uh a bunch of harmless uh peaceful uh morally upstanding group of people they weren't um i, I said before they they were bloodthirsty they were power hungry uh, one scholar writes this. He says, the Assyrians created the world's first great army and the world's first great empire. And this was held together by two factors. Their superior abilities in siege warfare and their reliance on sheer, unadulterated terror. Okay? That's how they were able to conquer. And the scholar goes on to give an example of this. There was an inscription found in an Assyrian temple that was written by one of their kings after they had conquered a particular city. The king writes this, I built a pillar at the city gate and I flayed all the chief men who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up inside the pillar and some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. I love just kind of the nonchalantness that he just kind of writes this with. Yeah, I flayed some people, I skinned them, and I impaled them, or I buried them alive. You know, depending on my mood. Look, Jonah knows this reputation. He knows what the Assyrians are capable of. 
And so he, and look, you and I would have been no different. He cannot understand why God would show these kind of people mercy. And because he doesn't like it, and because he doesn't want God to do it, he gets angry. Now, what about you? How would you respond if, just for sake of argument, if the leaders of the Proud Boys were shown mercy? And they repented. What about leaders of other white supremacy groups? What about leaders of those that have um, that have that have been over overtly violent in the in the riots? What if God showed them mercy and they repented? How would you respond? What if, what if God showed mercy to the police officers in the Breonna Taylor, Breonna Taylor case, and they repented? Would you be angry? What if, um, dare I say it, what if President Trump was shown mercy and he repented? Would you be angry? I mean, what, what, what if, what if the bullies from your past, your abusive parents, your, your awful boss, what if, what if, what if they were shown mercy and they repented? How would you respond? It is not easy. It is not easy. But if we're going to follow Jesus, there are ways in which we have to respond. Ways that he calls us to respond. Maybe you remember from um, from Luke 15. And before I read Luke 15, I, I, I want to, man, I want to, I wish I would have said this before. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't. I didn't. I, I want to, I want to reiterate. I, I want to emphasize. I, I'm not saying that there should not be consequences for the actions of some of the groups of people that I just mentioned. I'm not saying that. And, and please know, I'm also not saying that everyone just needs to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and just get along. Like, I'm not saying that either. What I am saying is that there is a, an infinite magnitude, if you will, of the way God shows mercy and the way we respond to it. So, for example, I want to get back to this. Um, in Luke 15, uh, the, the parable, the, the, the parables of, of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sons. And in each one of those, um, Jesus is telling the parable of what it what it means for lost people to repent and to come back. And so, at the end of the lost sheep, Jesus says, "Just so I tell you, there will be more joy, more joy, in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety nine righteous persons who need no repentance." In the parable of the lost coin, Jesus says, "Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents." And then in the parable of the lost sons, remember the, the younger brother squanders all his father's inheritance on, on prostitutes. And he comes home. And the father throws him a party. And when the older son hears about it, he calls his servants and says, hey, what's going on? And Jesus in the parable says, he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? And the servant said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. <laughs> he was angry. 
at the Father's mercy. The question before us is, do we have a small view of God's mercy? Maybe it's smaller than we want to admit. So Eugene Peterson tells a story when he was a little kid growing up in uh, rural Montana. He had a neighbor, a neighbor by the name of Louis Storm. His wife's name was Olga. Louis and Olga Storm, two huge Norwegians uh, to little Eugene. And one day when Eugene was five years old, he was at the fence watching Leonard on his brand new shiny green John Deere tractor. And Eugene wanted to get on that tractor, but he dare not cross the fence. And Lewis, the big Norwegian farmer, sees Eugene and he starts waving his arms, doing this. But Eugene, as a five-year-old, he doesn't know what that means. He doesn't know how to interpret it. So he actually runs the other way. The following Sunday at church, Lewis comes up to Eugene and says, Little Pete! Little Pete, why did you run away when I was trying to get your attention the other day? And Eugene says, I didn't know that's what you were trying to do. And Leonard says, Little Pete, when you're trying to get someone to, to come to you, what, what do you do? And so imagine little five-year-old Eugene Peterson says, well, when I want somebody to come to me, I just, I just do this. Come here, come here. And Lewis says, that's piddling, little Pete. That's piddling. On the farm, we do things big. We wave our arms and we want you to come, 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 come. Not this. And little, and sorry, Eugene says this. I was crushed. I felt small. I was already small on the outside. Now I felt small on the inside. Disappointed and crushed, but also a little angry. This gigantic Norwegian farmer calling me and my world piddling. I was a five-year-old Jonah, displeased exceedingly. You see, this was Jonah's issue. He had this view of God's mercy. Instead of this view, come, come to me. All of you, all who are weary, all who labor, all who are destroying yourselves. Come to me. Jonah could not comprehend mercy to be big enough for people like the Assyrians. Now, he knew this intellectually, right? I mean, he even says, I knew, I knew that you're a gracious God. In verse 2, I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He knew it intellectually. But to actually see God act on it, he just couldn't, he just couldn't comprehend with the rest of his being. Jonah is controlled by anger. God, as it were, is controlled by mercy. And look, this is, this is the theme of the book. I mean, you see this from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 4. It, it's mercy that sends Jonah to the Assyrians in the first place, or that calls Jonah in the first place. It's mercy that sends the giant fish to save Jonah from drowning. It's mercy that the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. It's mercy that God appoints a plant to provide shade and to save Jonah from his discomfort. But it is also mercy that leads God to appoint a worm and a scorching wind so that Jonah can see he cares more about his own comfort than he does about human beings. I am, you are, we're more, way more like Jonah than we want to acknowledge. We care more about our own comfort. And when that comfort is um, challenged or removed, even if it's for uh, the betterment of other people, we get angry. And look, 
and, and that's not the only way that we're like Jonah. I mean, humanity is all through Jonah, right? Uh, sometimes we run away from the presence of God. Sometimes we obey. Sometimes we trust. Sometimes uh, we don't trust at all and we're unfaithful. Sometimes we're selfless and we would do anything for other people. And sometimes all we care about is ourselves. Sometimes we're angry over certain injustices of the world. And then sometimes we don't pay any attention to the others that are happening right across the street from us. Sometimes we show mercy and sometimes we would just rather do away with people altogether. We're all over the place. We're all over the map. Jonah reveals our inconsistencies. He reveals our hypocrisy. He reveals a lack of compassion in our own hearts. He reveals our small view of God's mercy, our piddling, if you will. While at the same time, while at the same time pointing our hearts to the very one who is greater than all of our piddling. Remember back in Matthew 12, Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, saying, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is that one. The one that is greater than Jonah. The one where mercy and anger kiss. I mean, just think about some of the some of the things you know about Jesus in the Gospels. Um, it is mercy that leads Jesus to heal the man with leprosy when nobody else would touch him. It is mercy that leads Jesus to heal the blind man when he's coming out of Jericho when everyone else is telling them to shut up. But it's anger that leads Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. Anger over death and sin and evil. It is anger at the Pharisees that leads him to heal a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. It is mercy, it is mercy that compels his heart to have pity and compassion on the crowds because they were sick and had no shepherd to lead them. And it's anger that puts him on the cross at the first in the first place but it's mercy that moves him to call out father forgive them for they do not know what they do you see both in jesus you see mercy and you see anger and don't forget we can never forget that it's actually god's anger god's anger at your sin God's anger at death, God's anger at evil, his anger at your unfaithfulness and your lack of trust, your lack of obedience, his anger over the way that you attack and dehumanize others. It is that anger that puts Jesus on the cross. It is that anger that Jesus absorbs on your behalf so that God is no longer angry at you, but he shows mercy toward you. All of the anger that was poured out on Jesus so that God now moves towards us in the same way that Jonah talks about when he says that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is the way God responds to you. So, what do we do with all that? I mean, look, um, I would imagine if I was listening to this sermon, uh, I would, I would perhaps uh, be angry or at least maybe frustrated. Um, 
because there's just kind of the so what, right? I mean, what, what does this mean day in and, and day out for me? And, um, and, and let me, um, and let me just say, look, I, I've, I've, I've struggled all week in how to, how to best apply that and how to think through that. I mean, even in my own heart and life, when I, when I feel anger rising up at someone in my family or when people won't use a crosswalk like that, that I mean, that's just how shallow I am and I feel it. Um, and so let, let, let me help uh, with that, with that question of so what and what do we do by saying, um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and, and part of that's on purpose. Like I, I don't know what would be best for you. I don't know the best way for you to necessarily respond. Um, but, but, but not giving you a direct application is, is kind of on purpose as well, because, um, the way that the Jonah ends, right? It ends with a question. It ends with a question and there's no answer. Um, one of my, one of my kids felt like this was like a mic drop from God. Um, yeah, so, the, so the question is posed in verse 11, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? You know, boom, Jonah, deal with that. Because no matter how Jonah responds to it, it's going to stir up all sorts of stuff in him. And, and so if he says, yes, you should show pity, then Jonah has to realize his, his issue about the plant is so disproportionate. <laughs> Uh, to what God is doing. If he says no, then he has to come to the realization that he doesn't really care about other people. And so Jonah, um, we don't know what Jonah says. We don't know how he responds. We don't know um, if it's life-changing or, or what happens. And I think that's on purpose because then it forces the reader to think about what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Are we going to just ignore our anger, pretend it's not there? Or are we going to let it take over? And I think what God is saying to Jonah and what is he saying to me is that we're going to have to stop and slow down enough to think through that. We're so busy. We're so tired and, we, and we're making snap judgments and rash decisions instead of taking the time to just simply sit and pray. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that to be trite and I'm not saying that we just need to withdraw from everything. But what I am saying is that we need to regroup. And the only way we can do that is to stop long enough to listen. To look at our own hearts. To see where that anger is coming from. What's stirring it up and how we're responding. To repent where we need to repent. To confess where we need to confess. And learn what it would mean to follow Jesus. And show mercy. And be angry all at the same time. Let me pray to that end. Father, help us in that. We cannot do this on our own. So show us. Give us wisdom and discernment that is beyond us. Help us to respond to the world in ways that are different from the world. That they would see that you're big enough to deal with our anger. But that the world would also see that your mercy is way bigger than we can even begin to comprehend. Do this in your church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you have a great week. And, um, and the Lord be with you.